Welcome back to the Plowcast. I'm Susanna Black, Senior Editor at Plow. And I'm Pete Momsen, Editor-in-Chief at Plow. On this final episode of this season of the Plowcast, we'll talk with Zena Hitz of The Catherine Project, and then we'll be taking your questions. And now, welcome to Zena Hitz. Zena is a tutor in the Great Books Program at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, and is the author most recently of Lost in Thought, The Hidden Pleasures of an Intellectual Life. Her most recent project is The Catherine Project, and that is what she is here to talk about with us today. Welcome, Zena. Do you want to uh, just give us the very basics? Like, what what is this thing? Uh, how did it come to be? So the Catherine Project is um, a online education institution. It's meant to provide high quality education connected to great books to anyone. Uh, so we wanted to take advantage of um, the capacity of something like Zoom or video conferencing to connect individuals with one another. So online education has in general been a matter of mass education. You, you break things down into some content and then you just promulgate it as widely as you can. And there's some good things you can do that way, but the type of education I'm interested in has always been personal. Yeah. Um, it's been forming communities where uh, you talk about the, the fundamental questions, the deep questions with one another. So um, it was in the summer of 2020 when we were in lockdown and I was struggling to, I had just been struggling to find a way to do my emergency Zoom teaching for my regular day job at St. John's. And one of the things I noticed was that small groups or one-on-one -on -one conversations worked better than uh, larger ones. So that, uh, and in a way that there was uh, less of a difference than one might think between talking to a person, a very small group or one-on-one -on -one over Zoom or over video conference and talking to them in person. So that sort of stuck somewhere in the back of my mind. And then of course, when, when Lost in Thought came out, uh, ever since then, I've started to I get a fair number of uh, letters and emails from people who uh, or Twitter direct messages from people who really are taken res who this type of education that I describe in the book, this type of activity of learning for its own sake. So these people would write to me and they would ask me for advice as to how they could live the kind of activities I talk about in the book, given that they weren't graduate students, they weren't undergraduates. They maybe were full-time caregivers. Uh, they may had, have had young kids at home, but they wanted to take what spare time they had to, to do this. So somehow um, those two things came together and I realized that it would be very possible just to connect people who wanted to learn together um, and to find some volunteers to help lead them in conversations or to lead them in small group tutorials, which is something else that we do. Um, and that was the Catherine Project. I ran it uh, on no budget out of my Twitter account for a year. We've grown uh, enormously. So we now have uh, a mailing list of 1,500 people. We have in our groups right now about 300 readers. Um, that's not counting the people that we've served in the past. So there's more or less unlimited demand for this kind of thing. And uh, the question is for us is just how to um, meet that need, that desire that people have uh, as best we can while, while keeping the spirit of the thing and the character of the thing. So. Which is that in-person teaching that is sort of the, the genesis of the idea. And it is amazing um, that that desire is out there. What are some of the texts the books that you um, interact with? So one component is that person-to-person -person conversation. The other component is great books um, and uh, great traditions. So uh, every culture has, has its own wisdom tradition. Uh, and these are often, especially these days, written down. There are conversations that take place over centuries. And the advantage of learning from books is that the books equalize uh, the students in the classroom and the teachers and the students. A great book, which I get asked a lot, what's a great book? Um, it's a book that can do that. 
it's a book that can teach someone at any level. Uh, so, you know, I can sit down with my freshman at St. John's and read uh, a Greek tragedy, and maybe I've read it a dozen times. Um, they're reading it for the first time. It's sufficiently rich and sufficiently deep and sufficiently complex that I can keep learning about it even after many years. And they are learning about it even though they're just beginners. So you can develop these types of conversations that are collaborative, that are spontaneous, that are alive, where everyone is learning. So that's why we use books as well as conversation in our, our work. Um, we, uh, we, we've done particularly well with, with literature. So Homer's Iliad and Odyssey is something that we always have managed to offer. Uh, Virgil and Ovid, so Latin literature and Dante. We also have done a fair amount of philosophy, Plato, Kierkegaard. And right now we have two groups on Confucius, on uh, Chinese philosophy, Confucius and Mencius. Um, and so we, we, most of our, the background of the volunteers is in what goes by the name of the Western tradition, the European tradition. Um, but we think of a tradition as being uh, any group of excellent books that's connected with one, with uh, a tradition. So there's a Chinese tradition, an Islamic tradition, an Indian tradition, um, and various other kinds of traditions. And we're open to teaching any any of them. Uh, we, we are just dependent on our volunteers to uh, to come to us with the willingness to lead groups on them. Both your book, Lost in Thought, The Hidden Ple Pleasures of an Intellectual Life, and um, available wherever you get books, I guess. Um, and also <laughs> the Catherine Project have this kind of premise, which is that there's something called an intellectual life that humans kind of by nature seem to have a hunger for. Um, do you want to, and, and obviously the demand for the Catherine Project and the response to it um, has sort of seems to at least somewhat back that up. Do you want to talk about the sort of like your experience with that fact of human nature, basically? Right. So I, I began um, writing about intellectual life and great books and the liberal arts about seven years ago, about 2015. And I did so because I couldn't, there was a lot of conversation in the magazines about it, uh, the crisis in the humanities, as it was called. But all of the uh, writing was defensive and put in terms that seemed to me alien from the kind of thing it was. So it, it, it was for some time, the main strategy of people like me or people who worked in jobs like mine, humanities, humanist academics, to say that these studies um, build your critical thinking skills and they're great training for designing apps in Silicon Valley. And you know they're great for Wall Street and you can make a lot of money and you can, um, do all kinds of high prestige work if you if you study something like philosophy or something like literature. And it's not that that's wrong. I think that this kinds of studies can help you do all kinds of things, but it wasn't the reason why any of us ever got into these things. So, and the reason that we all got into it was because I, and I think it's very general, even if it's not always cultivated, there's a natural human desire to know and to understand and to think about things to think about the basics of human life, um, the nature of the family, the nature of community, the nature of political organizations, uh, the nature of God, the nature of nature itself. So, you know, birds and trees and oceans and chemicals and the way that things move. Uh, these are part of what it means to be a human being to think about these things. And there's a testament to that in the fact that, as I say, every culture <clears throat> is that we know of has a wisdom tradition. They have a tradition of thinking and contemplating uh, what a human being is and their place in the world. Um, and, um, you know, we have this beautiful thing in, uh, in, in the U.S. and in, in Europe uh, in, and in Europe descended um, uh, communities where there are these books which in which these things have been collected and preserved and studied. Um, and they have shown time and time again to be educators of people, not in a way that indoctrinates or 
or tells them what to think, but just to help people develop their capacity to, to reflect um, on these fundamental questions of human existence. When I first started out, I thought that this was, I was being a bit romantic. I thought, of course, I think that everyone has this desire. But since my writing has come out and since the response to the book and since seeing people come into the Catherine Project, I get more and more confirmation every day that in fact, I was right. It is a natural human desire. And there's way more of it out there than our institutions are, are um, responding to. So there's a real need, not just for the Catherine Project, but for organizations like it to uh, just provide um, opportunities to think and to study, uh, not, not to get a better job, not to necessarily advance yourself, but to just to become a richer, fuller human being. We have this vision of education um, as, or even a liberal arts education, as this thing that you do for four years at the end of high school, which is kind of like an intellectual finishing school. And then once you're done with that, then you are done with that part of your life. And then you go on to whatever other hobbies or, you know, employment or relationships or whatever you may have. Um, but the, the sort of fundamental insight, I think, of the tradition that you're talking about that, comes, that came to you through St. John's um, College in Annapolis, um, you know, I went to Amherst, it was a similar kind of thing, is, just, is there's this... this there, there are these two principles, you know, one, one is that all humans have the desire to know, like you see something going on and you want to know what's going on. You want to know explanations for things. You want to, you know, this is what drives journalism. This is what drives science. This is what drives, you know, all the kinds of things that um, when your curiosity gets piqued um, and that curiosity can be both for the external world and kind of for the internal structures of the world. Um, and then the other aspect, which I really think that the Catherine Project and your book both seem to me to be getting at very well. Is just the idea that um, that philosophy begins in wonder. It begins in a sort of contemplation of beauty of some kind, and then like getting curious about that beauty, and getting curious about your own response to that beauty. And these are like such fundamental human experiences that you start having as soon as you're conscious, basically. And then I think it can get beat out of you by, you know, a difficult life or a life that doesn't seem to encourage that. It can also get beat out of you by an education that is attempting to address yeah. that, like officially. Because So do you want to talk about the kind of unofficialness of the Catherine Project? Like you guys don't offer any, you know, you know um, sort of certifications or anything. I guess neither did Socrates. No, neither did Socrates. <laughs> no credits, no degrees. Part of that is that um, we wanted to keep our organization simple. And we thought, given that there's a natural desire to know, <laughs> there can be also just a natural sense of accountability. That is, if people want this, they'll sign up for it. If they like it, they'll stay and do more. And if they don't, they won't. Um, <laughs> there's a there's something beautiful about that kind of simplicity. Um, so we're running on the love of learning alone. All of our staff are volunteers, apart from one one uh, executive director, and but all the all the teaching staff, all the group leading staff are volunteers, and that means that you you have to want to be there. Um, so now there's plenty of official education education for credit. Which is, which is excellent or good. Um, there's all kinds of people, especially you know, individual teachers who, however hostile the institutional environment, are really trying every day to connect with their students and to mentor them and to teach them and to pass on to them something good. Um, but they are often acting against the institutional constraints. And I, I think that's gotten a bit, it's gotten worse and worse over the course of my lifetime. And part of that is a problem of scale. So co colleges and universities, for instance, for the past 20 years, they've been trying to pack more and more students into every classroom because that way they get more tuition revenue to support the salaries or the compensation of a, of a staff person, of a faculty person. So they're, they're trying to keep their bottom lines clean and they do that by packing the classrooms. When you pack the classrooms, you're diminishing the quality of your education. And there's a point where you've done that, you've gone too far, and what you're doing is actually not worth doing anymore. 
but we have no way of a, a we have, there's no sense of accountability for when that happens uh because people need the degrees they need the credits they need to make their way in the world there's such a strong custom of going to college i was really inspired when i was writing lost in thoughts and thinking about education in reading about the grassroots intellectual organizations of the past so if you from the 19th i think from the late 18th century through the 19th century into the mid 20th century you had um grassroots intellectual organizations often from people who were shut out for one reason or another from conventional education institutions so there were working class groups connected to labor unions they would get together and form institutes they would read plato and uh, or literature and they would talk to one another and they would help to teach themselves teach one another um, in the education that they were being deprived of elsewhere and they would find in that their the dignity that might be denied them by their uh, exploitative working conditions also a wonderful tradition not told enough of uh, black american reading groups reading clubs reading literary societies um, all through the 19th century again people who are shut out from uh, other educational institutions in the united states but who what who knew that their dignity lay in in developing these parts of themselves uh, knew that they were capable of it and had a desire for it and so they found their own way to do it. So we're also inspired by those groups, that is, um, groups which under which which relied on the premise that people, everyone was capable of learning, everyone desired to learn, and everyone was capable of taking responsibility for their learning, and and that all we needed was to form communities to help one another, support one another in this endeavor. So we're also trying to tap into that. When I was a little kid, some of my mentors were uh, uh, these older guys who were part of the trade union movement in the 1930s um, and who still, um, you know, they were mechanics, they were uh, tool and die makers, whatever. They, they had no pretensions to, I mean, they were kind of proud to be proletarian, and yet you'd go to their, their living room and they would have Tolstoy or um, Nietzsche or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff lying around the living room. And that's what's forgotten, because it seems, you know, you say the phrase intellectual life, and people instantly think it's a certain cast of credentialed people. One of the reactions that people have by work is they say, well, intellectual life is elitist. It's for aristocrats. Leisure is for aristocrats. And part of me wants to, part of me wonders, yeah, how seriously do, did aristocrats, when there was, when there were aristocrats and when this was their, their privilege to have this kind of education, how seriously did they take their learning? It was something that you yeah. did. I mean, there were certainly people who took to it um, and who, who really thought about things and who wrote wonderful books. But as a part of a standard education, I don't know that it was ever taken uh, very seriously. And I think that those, you know, the, the people that Peter's talking about, the sort of mechanics and um, construction workers who found those things for themselves, they took, they took more seriously to it than I think their aristocratic forebears did. Um, it means something to them. And that's the same with Catherine, our Catherine Project groups. People are incredibly serious. Um, I just keep getting blown away by the level of commitment and level of zeal that people from all walks of life are bringing to our groups. Um, and, you know, that that's partly because it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't get you anywhere. Um, we, you know, we, we're not we don't we don't have any job opportunities at the other end. Um, this network is probably not a network through which you can uh, make your way in, in on Wall Street. And nowadays it doesn't even get you a lot of cultural prestige points to quote any of this stuff right so in a way um there, there's maybe an advantage to that that you're not just burnishing your sort of finishing cr school credentials um you're actually doing it because you love it you may be making yourself right. more more objectionable and, and more cancelable the more you know the catherine project is kind of the most in a way the most pure um form of this that i know of but there are a couple of others that i know of that are you know, tend to be more Christian associated. So the Theopolis Institute and the Davenant Institute 
And then the Thomistic Institute is associated with um, colleges and universities, but it's also aimed at the public. Humans need this, apparently, and they're not going to not do it. They just are going to do it like either badly or well, it seems to me. Well, I, and I think that I, I, I love those organizations. I, I, I lecture for the Thomistic Institute. I'm a big fan. Um, but I think that one thing that we do do that's distinctive from them also is that we actually don't have an agenda that's that's religious or political in any way. So, um, and that's part of, I think of that as being an exercise of hospitality. That is, this type of learning can bring it, is something which all kinds of people are interested in. And these books are bonds of unity between very different kinds of people. And they help all of us to, to connect with our humanity uh, in a really rich, deep way. And that doesn't, that doesn't determine particular outcomes. Uh, yeah. And th th that's quite precious to me, even though quite a lot of people involved, especially, um, you know, our board and our executive director, most of us are, are, are religious or are Christians in some way or other. But um, our participants are, are, some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, but I, um, I feel like we used to have more institutions that were open to that kind of just human earnestness and willingness to connect on fundamental things. So I'm happy if, you know, I mean, we, we, we teach religious texts. We have Augustine's Confessions and Dante and all kinds of things. Uh, Hebrew Bible, um, and, and and we're happy to keep doing that. Um, but it it we we want to not present it in a way from a perspective of commitment. And I think that might seem weird to 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 people who haven't been in a community like that, which are rarer and rarer. Um, but that is important to us, I think. Where the pieces aren't being instrumentalized. I mean, one other institution that is like that. Um, I, I think is uh, one of our sister magazines that we're huge fans of at the point in 2020. Uh, John Baskin, the editor, and Anastasia Berg, also an editor, wrote a New York Times op-ed where they uh, talked about the reopening of the American mind and basically, uh, in a somewhat provocative way, um, prophesied that the future of, of humanities of liberal learning in its original sense um, was outside the university proper. Uh, that caused a bit of an uproar among some. What do you think of that idea? Because it seems like the Catherine Project might be held up as an example of what they were talking about. Well, um, I want to be a, a bit more cautious than one might su suspect for the following reasons. I've spent most of my life in universities. Enough of my life to know not only that they they have very serious problems, especially when it comes to teaching, you know, basic education, but also that there are a lot of things that will be lost if if those institutions continue on their trajectory of decline. There are things which an organization like the Catherine Project can never do. We can't have a biology lab. Um, <laughs> we can't. Um, you know, we, 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 we'd like to have a library someday, but we'll probably never be able to have a research library. It's quite expensive to have a research library. Um, so th there are things which I think will be lost. So it's actually my hope. My first choice would be for organizations like Catherine Project or The Point, which I think is wonderful, or um, all of the, the grassroots intellectual organizations that are, that are sort of blossoming right now. Um, that they put some pressure on the old school institutions to open up, to change, to reform themselves, to reach back out to um, the, the human need to learn and to try to bust out a little bit of the straitjacket of everything else that's going on. So that would be my first choice. That said, um, if that doesn't happen and it can't be guaranteed, um, if, if they do continue on the trajectory of decline, then I'm happy to have the Catherine Project be out there as a place where people can find this type of learning um, as it becomes rarer and rarer elsewhere. So it's already very rare, to be honest. It could be revived in institutions, and there would be advantages to that. 
Um, but I'm not going to depend on that. And I, I, I'm happy to see um, us think with more freedom about um, how to fulfill our lives, how to be bigger and better human beings. It's one of the great traditions of the United States that maybe we are neglecting a bit to form organizations and little communities. And, um, you know, we can't keep beating our fist against the wall trying to get institutions to change. You know, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but you're, you know, you want to be the change that you want to see in the world. You know, if there's something that you need and there's something that you want, well, get some people together and do it. Uh, it's one of the parts of American mm -hmm. culture I find most touching and most inspiring. So that's also, I suppose, part of our spirit. And you mentioned the history of that in the 19th century with, you know, the those black reading groups and with the trade unions and oh, the interest that you're seeing, which is so encouraging. And frankly, I can say uh, with, with our work with Plow, there are at least several tens of thousands of people who are really interested yeah. in having these conversations yeah. uh, and care about it and are willing to, you know, do some work too, to, to read some things and talk about some things that, you know, you don't do just because it's easy and, um, you know, it's not necessarily beachside reading. Right. Although I guess it could be. <laughs> So you teach in an ordinary classroom, or not ordinary, St. John's is not ordinary, um, but you teach in a classroom in a, in a college setting, and you also teach through Catherine Project. What have the, been some of the differences that you've seen? I, I'll be honest, the Catherine Project is, is uh, pretty heavily St. John's influenced, and a lot of our, <laughs> a lot of our group leaders are alums, um, because... St. John's has developed over time uh, habits of conversation which really work well for the purposes that we're talking about. So, you know, you can get a bunch of random people into a Zoom room with a reading and it cannot be a particularly good conversation. People can Google random facts about the authors or they can share various little bits of expertise they've picked up here and there. That's not going to get down into the fundamental human questions. So, so, so St. John's at St. John's we we get we train our students and we train ourselves to to do that to have conversations of that kind. So, I don't think the style of conversations is so different. It is more. It's definitely a big, a lot um, wider swathe of humanity that comes to Catherine Project. So, I think that's tr truthfully. Uh, the main difference in terms of what happens in the room is just that you have adults from all different walks of life with various kinds of experience. And unlike undergraduates, they know why they're there. Um, you know, they, they're not just going off to college because they're going to college. They're taking time out of their week, you know, night after night to read and to talk to people. So they're, they're, there's maybe a bit high, higher level of commitment and, and the... Um, and it's a it's a, it's a white it's definitely it looks more like the human race in a Catherine Project room than um, than than your average St. John's classroom. People come from all over the world, and they love these books. They come alive for these books, and it was one of the things that testified to me of the human value of a great book. That is, we think they have a reputation for being nationalistic, jingoistic. <coughs> You know, these are American books, these are European books, these are Western books. But you, you, you know, when you have people from Nepal or Namibia or Korea or um, wherever, and they come in and they love the books, then you know that something else is going on, um, it seems to me. So anyway, that, I, I would say that's the main difference. Um, and, and it's a bit more spontaneous also. So our groups sometimes just go on longer than they were originally scheduled to do because people are so excited. And but the the St. John's also has a reading group custom custom of reading groups, um, spontaneous reading groups on various topics, and we also work by conversation. The main contrast is not between the Catherine Project and St. John's. The main contrast is between those places and conventional universities, where classes are not conducted by discussion necessarily, even in the humanities. Um, 
you know, you uh, is they're conducted by lecture. If there if there are discussions, they're not generally taken as seriously. They're led by TAs or grad students, not necessarily by um, by the professors. Uh, everything is driven by grades, and there's so much that's lost in terms of real learning, independent thinking, um, spontaneity, joy. <laughs> All, so much of the goodness of learning gets lost in that process. I have one last question. So if I don't feel the need to have an intellectual life, why should I have one? That's a great question. Um, I think that it's a delicate thing. Um, I'm not interested in shaming people for not being interested um, but I do think that probably that isn't the final word on who a person is if they say, I'm not interested in having an intellectual life. So something has to happen to that person whereby they realize that, in fact, this thing that they've been doing all along or this thing that they might really enjoy manifests itself to them. Maybe it's, you know, reading a certain kind of an article in Plow. Maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's an encounter with a certain reality in the world, you know, a, a bug or a bird or a particular kind of plant. Um, but I think that, I think that's not a permanent condition. So I, you know, uh, you know, what's, what do they say in, in the, in the prophets, right? A, a bruised reed, he will not break. Uh, I'm not interested in um, breaking any bruised reeds. Like I'm not interested in going after people who, who, are co- who bo- feel themselves to be comfortable with not having intellectual interests. Um, but I suspect that the more the culture is infused with um, wholesome human ways of doing it, the more they'll see that this is in fact a part of their heritage too. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's person by person, eh? Like everything that matters. Um, there, it, you know, it's, and I think it's not so different from how, you know, Christians like us think about um, God or the gospel. There are people who say, like, you know, I, I, I just don't need a religion. I, it's, just not, it's just not for me. And you want to respect that. That's something that uh, that person, that means something to them. On the other hand, you're probably pretty confident that that's not all that's going on. Um, and that and that eventually with with certain kinds of experiences, something else will open up. There are two other things that I think are like that, as well as sort of, sort of basically philosophy writ large, and then religion, you know, the gospel writ large. The other two kinds of things that I feel like people often will say, it's just not my thing, and then, and you can be like, oh, I kind of think it is, and you just don't know it yet, are um, something like physical activity, like not doing sports, because it's a horrifying thought to me, but like like running or doing something with your muscles or like walking or like you can say, I'm not really like a sportsy person, but you're, but like it, there is part of you that definitely is there that like you are a human being. And one of the things I know about you is that you, that you are, you know, you are made to move around in the physical world. And then the other thing that people often say is like, you know, I'm not that into nature. Like I'm not an outdoorsy person. And and it's kind of like, oh, I kind of think you are, though. I think. No, I think that's right. And I, I think that especially the case of sports, and this that hits home for me because, um, you know, I, I've never been much of a sports person. And that's partly because of the wounds I received as a child <laughs> being so bad at them <laughs> and being humiliated. And that hap- that's a very, very common feature of intellectual life people who they think they're not intellectual. And it's, a lo- it, it's very painful for me. I hear it all the time. Oh, I'm not really, I'm not a real thinker. Oh, I'm not a real reader. Oh, I'm not a real this. I'm not a real that. And there's some wound talking because they've been, they've had these, been exposed to these things in a competitive context and they've been judged by some outsider not to be worthy of entry into the, the Holy of Holies. And I, I think that that's one reason why it's very important to have non-competitive, collaborative intellectual community. Um, and where there aren't, where the marker of success is, well, do you, do you feel like you learned something? 
<laughs> not how are you compared to the other people in the room. So I, I think, like with many things, a little, a little kindness, and I think trying to create environments that are really respectful of individuals um, and recognizing that each person has their own way of living out their humanity. Not all of us are going to be mountain climbers, but, but we can all really enjoy being outside in some beautiful scenery for a bit. Um, so I, I, I think that's a great analogy, too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zena. Thank you for making time for this and for this great conversation, and good luck. Thanks so much, Peter and Susanna. And now it's time for the questions and answers from you, our dear listeners. Uh, so all about music, I assume. Susanna, do you want to ask the questions? Sure. We have a number of questions here, many from uh, repeat offender friends of the plow um, or friends of the pod, uh, many from Twitter, some not from Twitter. Um, let's just start out with a couple of really interesting ones from Paul Duggan that get right to it. One, has music ever made anyone a better person? Mm. Combined with two, has music ever made anyone a worse person? Well, clearly the answer is yes. Yeah, I think that's true. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is not straightforward. I mean, we talked about this in the first uh, episode um, because your editorial addressed this a little bit. There's clearly a sense in which music does something to you. It enlists your emotions. It enlists your emotions. It can enlist your emotions on behalf of, you know, you know good ideas or good associations. It can manipulate you and... Um, you know, make you worse. Um, yeah, I think it is. And the same music, weirdly enough, can do all those things yeah. to you. Yeah. So there's a bunch of ways to, to kind of branch off here, right? So there's music, you know, with words, music that carries a message. Sort of the original ancient Greek idea of music is sort of encompassing all of the arts, including, you know, poetry that drama. may be chanted, yeah. drama. And then there's, you know, what the romantics called pure music, right? So the the music that's instrumental uh, and is acts on, on your soul without any verbal uh, component, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the question of, is there music that makes you good more and is, and, and is thus good music, morally good music, and is there morally bad music? I mean, I'm not sure... I. I kind of tend to think that there is music that even in the absence of any context would push you in one direction or another. I'm pretty sure that's true, even without words. However, we also never, we're human beings and just like we don't encounter hardly anything without any context, we certainly don't encounter music out of context. So, I mean, if you are at a, you know, as you described in the editorial, if you're at a sort of, you know, performance of, um, Ode to Joy um, with Goebbels in the audience and you're like sitting there and you're sitting there listening to Ode to Joy and this beautiful music is washing over you and you are repeatedly deciding, like letting the music carry you away rather than like, you know, getting up and like leaving. The, I don't know what you would do if I shooting Goebbels or something. I guess not, probably not. This is a pacifist podcast. But, you know, if you're letting music soothe you, soothe you away from a conscience response or a, like attention to reality, um, then even beautiful, beautiful music in the wrong context, um, I think probably screws you up. And you can watch this performance that Susanna is, is referring to is happening in the midst of World War II in Berlin under the, uh, the baton of the conductor Fort Wengler, a famous performance. On YouTube, you can find the video, uh, which is a propaganda video. And in the audience are not only Goebbels, but all these uh, German officers just straight back home from the front. Um, so this is music being instrumentalized mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. So this is Beethoven being the Aryan right. genius. And we're playing his music. We're celebrating his music. Music in that instance is making you worse because mm -hmm. you're using it for evil mm -hmm. ends. I guess, and this question is really huge and really broad mm -hmm. but is there music that kind of granted that music can be used for bad purposes mm -hmm. and of course we want to say too that music can be good used for good purposes mm -hmm. right 
Um, it's hard to imagine for me that something like Johann Sebastian Bach's St. Matthew Passion could be used for a bad purpose. I find I mean, it really hard to imagine how. Um, and that, to me, is also something inherent in the music to, yeah. to a degree that there is a there is a spirit of prayer that went into writing that music. Bach, of course, is famous for writing, you know, Soli Deo Gloria, you know, to God alone be glory at the end of his, mm -hmm. you know, compositions. Um, I, I think there is a spirit mm -hmm. in that music that probably would resist it being used for horrible means. And I think that also would really help that music be used for really good ones. Yeah. Um, and, we're staying in the realm of classical, but I think you could kind of apply that to to music that's that's not classical. Mm -hmm. um, I think of folk music, mm -hmm. uh, music that came out of pain, out of struggle. We spoke earlier in this podcast with mm -hmm. Stephen Newby about black spirituals. Mm -hmm. I think of a lot of European folk songs mm -hmm. that came from. The suffering, the loves, the pains of people over centuries uh, that were loved, that were sung to children, mm -hmm. that were sung at people's deathbeds because it was, you know, the only music that an old person would still respond to. Uh, songs that have survived and that have still a kind of innocence to them mm -hmm. um, that resists being manipulated. Now, you know, of course, you can manipulate anything. Yeah, I mean, the, when as you were talking, I was sort of thinking about, all right, so you can twist scripture, like you can twist the word of God towards a bad end, like you, and that has to do with like you having a bad will and then using this as an instrument to try and do something bad. Like there are a thousand different ways that you can do this. One thing that script that happens with scripture though is that you know we have d descriptions of this, like it is sharper than a two-edged sword. It turns back on you. And it actually, I think, you know, the words of scripture, even if the devil is trying to quote them to, you know, tempt Jesus, or even if, you know, someone else is trying, like, sort of in a very abusive church is like quoting scripture and, you know, this this is sort of taken in as a kind of like um, association with abuse. Like, I think those words, I think God's actual word has this kind of like, won't let it mess, won't let you mess with it as much as that. Like there's the, you know, I think his spirit is kind of in his words and kind of does this sharper than a two edged sword thing back on the person who's trying to misuse it. And I kind of think that, you know, obviously music is not inspired in the same technical sense, but I think that there is a kind of beauty in really good music, um, that has that same kind of reflexive or it, like it, it will accuse you if you're trying to misuse it it will it will accuse you and it won't work and it will fundamentally undermine itself or it will fundamentally you will fundamentally undermine yourself if you are trying to use something like that for a bad purpose and i do think that just as there's music and I, I mentioned bach um that tends to the good there's music that at least for a certain kind of person who does not have a strong inner anchor mm -hmm. can easily dispose them toward evil. And mm -hmm. to stick in the classical register, I'll mention, you know, the uh, Richard Wagner's uh -huh. operas uh, that are clearly designed as a kind of um, direct appeal to religious emotions, mm -hmm. but without the object of worship uh, being very clear, mm -hmm. um, except it's pretty clearly not, the true God. Mm -hmm. Whatever and else it is, it's not Jesus. So while I greatly enjoy, and I actually can appreciate through a Christian understanding, um, Wagner's opera... Parsifal. Parsifal. I also think that, particularly if you, you know, see, like, the Mets recent uh, staging on it it's, it's available uh, as a high definition movie it'd be very easy to um, to experience that in an extremely anti-christian mm -hmm. way in a 
potentially idolatrous way. Mm-hmm. And the music invites that. Mm-hmm. It's not simply a series of decisions on the part of the director. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it speaks to the greatness of the music, and, and I think this is, this is kind of the point. This is, this is great music, mm-hmm. um, that you can experience it either way, mm-hmm. and it really depends on you. But uh, I think it does reflect a moral quality of the music. So you can have really great music that is morally problematic. And so our, our fellow editor, Catherine Kuiper, who studied with the great scholar Leon Kass, um, you know, l- likes to, to repeat something that he apparently told his students a lot, which is there's a thing about great books. And if you accept that a great book can make you a better person, you also have to accept the possibility that a great book can make you a worse person. Uh, to the extent that it's great art, it will act on you. Mm-hmm. And certain books tend more to act toward the good. I mean, the Bible is probably, a, a, you know, generally is a good thing to read. Um, and certain books are going to generally be bad. We can think of some of those quite easily. And then there's going to be some in the middle um, that are going to act on you a little bit depending on where you're at. Yeah. And I think music is very much the same. So we spent a long, long enough time on this. Yeah. All right. Um, well, he has another, he has another sort of sub question here, which we can. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Has music ever moved anyone's reason? Has music ever moved your reason? No, I mean, mus- music has never moved my reason. Like, that's not, I don't think that's what music does. I mean. I couldn't disagree more. I, okay. Oh, my gosh. All right, fine. Well, I was about to disagree with myself anyway, so you okay. can tell me why you were going to disagree. Let's start with an example, right? Okay. Let's st- start with, again, Bach. Okay. Um, there is uh, his absolutely incredible Chacon in D minor, written for solo violin. It's in one of his sonatas and partitas. It's written for a single uh, instrument that's obviously mostly thought of as a melodic instrument, not as a, a music that plays harmonies. Mm-hmm. And yet um, he, he essentially uses the violin a, as an organ. Uh-huh. Um, in this piece, which is incredibly intellectual it's also incredibly emotional it's not dry it's a chicane so it's based on a sort of recurring recurring bass uh and he's working in all kinds of things there's speculation that some of the inner harmonies follow um the melody of the chorale the passion tide chorale christ lay in death's dark prison and this was influenced by some tragedies that uh bach had experienced himself in his life um like so much of his music, there is layer upon layer of of both play and intellectual interest mm-hmm. see going on, as well as sheer emotional power. Um, and it's the type of music mm-hmm. that you engage with on all levels. Um, I believe it was Aaron Copeland once said he thought it was a bad habit to allow yourself to be carried away by music. You should always take a a step back Mm -hmm. and allow your reason to continue to function and to look at music. And uh, I realize, you know, you're you're saying no, just just let, you know, you're probably going to talk to me about Stephen Sondheim now. No, I'm not. No, Stephen Let let yourself be swept away by the the emotion and just, Well, not with Sondheim. Okay. Okay. All right. Fine. A, whatever. You you win. I lose this one. But B, also, I think I disagree with myself anyway. But C, Sondheim is not a good example of being swept away, of why, like, being swept away by music. Like, Sondheim actually is, has that same quality of distance. And, like, um, you know, the, there's cleverness and there's, um, there's wit. There's not the kind of, like, reason necessarily, although there sometimes is. Certainly, there's, you know, there's plenty of, you know, um, songs with ly- lyrical songs, songs with lyrics to them that have, you know, there's rational sort of content to the lyrics and that goes with music. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. I, there was one other thing that I, I, I do want to kind of pl- put in a plug for being swept away by some kinds of music. By, by it Which being, kind of music should be, we be swept away by? I mean, I think you can be swept away by like, I, was, I heard a, a live performance of uh, Rachmaninoff um, Piano Concerto yesterday. And it was like one of these things where like the music just kind of gets inside your body 
and it did feel like it turned off my brain and it, that felt fine. Like I didn't, I mean, it felt like that's what it was meant to do. Like it was, it felt, I mean, it was one of these experiences of listening to music that feels like you're running. It feels like almost an athletic thing. Um, and that does not feel like that does not in any way that I recognize engage my reason. It feels like a physical activity almost. And I think that that is absolutely fine. I think though, even there, even there, you're not being swept away by it. Um, so much as that it takes you to a place where your, your, your power of reason is still active. It's just not verbal. Okay, possibly. The other thing that I was thinking, as I was about to disagree with myself after my initial very certain answer, is that there's a quality of the resolution of musical phrases that feels like the resolution of a syllogism. Like it feels, it's almost a, a similar physical feeling to like, you know, you get to the end, you know where the musical phrase is going. It has to get there. If it doesn't get there, like you feel like you don't, might have to scratch out your brain a little bit or your ears. Um, and there's some quality to that that reminds me of the way that you can't really hear all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is, like, you, you, you have to go mortal. Like, you know, it feels like that kind of a thing. Um, not sure what that is. Might be reason. So we were talking earlier about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and, you know, that piece has a famous adagio mm -hmm. that goes on and on and is absolutely heavenly and um, literally heavenly. Mm -hmm. um, someone once told me, and, and I kind of agree, that if any piece of music sort of survives the transition to the, the age to come, mm -hmm. like more or less intact, uh -huh. it will be that one, and it will <laughs> still work pretty well. Um, and I think that kind of music makes you more reasonable in the sense that it, it reason in the big sense, right? Mm -hmm. Reason the, sort of the logos that's mm -hmm. put in each person that it makes you more attuned to that. And weirdly enough, this is precisely what, you know, the, that Confucian text, the book of rights that I um, referenced in my editorial for this issue points out that reason has that capacity mm -hmm. to bring us into line mm -hmm. with the natural law, the, yep. the orders of creation, whatever you want to call world. it. Yeah. Um, and that is true of good music, whether it's Beethoven or Bob Marley. Um, I think it can happen. Okay. So next question. All right. Uh, now we have a question from Alexi Sargent, friend of the pod, Alexi Sargent, husband to Leah Labresco, father to Thalia and Beatrice. Who's the funniest artist to whom to misattribute Imagine? I believe this is directed squarely at you, Susanna. I, I have been I have been suffering for the last couple of weeks. Not without reason. No, I brought it on myself, and I deserve it. And you know, hopefully, this suffering will purge me, and I will emerge from it a better person and a person who does not misattribute John Lennon's "Imagine" to Bob Dylan on Twitter, and then get roasted for it for two weeks straight. But and, that, and that don't is... don't imagine, Susanna, that the two weeks will bring an end to the roasting. But uh, we had to note this. Yeah. So your yeah. penance for the day has been done. I think I... we can leave Alexi's question there. Okay. Because I'm not a mean guy. Okay. Uh, all right. Peter Blair asks, which Bob Dylan song do you both prefer, The Final Countdown or Friday? Okay, more okay. of the same. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, Sam Howard has no questions but wants to heckle. Okay consider us heckled. Um, okay, here's one. What precisely is bad about CCM and why do you not allow it in your house? Pete, what is bad about Christian contemporary music and why do you not allow it in your house? Generalizing here, Christian contemporary music tends to be insincere. It appropriates what was originally a value and vital in different musical genres and manipulatively uses them to try to sell a religious message to young people uh, pr primarily and to artificially 
create a sense of hipness in religious worship services in a way that is an insult to the listener, to the creator, and to anyone near it. Um, there are very few things that I can see that are good about contemporary Christian music taken as a sort of industrial genre, right? Now, we had a great conversation earlier in this pod about some big exceptions to the rule. One of them is things like Christian hardcore that emerged as vital uh, vital genres of music uh, that had their own forms, their own inner logic, right? Um, that were expressions of true creativity. Uh, but the standard model of... Pastiche. Imitative. Imitative, you know, and of course many people have said this more interestingly than me, but I think there's just something so deeply damaging about that, of looking for what's kind of hot in the industry, grabbing that thing, stripping out the supposedly bad secular words and adding on Jesus words on top, mm -hmm. and then selling that as somehow a spiritually edifying product, or at least not deleterious product, to kids is just lying, insincere, degrading on so many levels, um, not least to the very gospel that is supposedly being served. Uh, so I'd almost without exception, not want that type of music in my house. I'd way rather have, you know, a few curse words and good music. Mm -hmm. um, and n there is Christian music. There's good Christian bands, right? But you kind of have to be a good artist first. Uh, and the idea that slapping Christian words on somehow dignifies crappy music mm -hmm. is, is just false. So that's what I think about CCM. And I realize I've probably just like deeply and mortally offended many people who, you know, grew up singing some DC talk song, which I can just barely manage to, to, to make myself watch. In fact, just you know, knowing this course is coming, I like forced myself to like listen to a oh, bunch yeah. of CCM yesterday. And it put me into such a rage that uh, I had to um, just calm, you know, calm myself down and take a long walk. <laughs> um. I have nothing to say. I have no background in CCM. <laughs> so we don't have any CCM defenders. I was hoping that I, I literally, I, given I'm the fact a, that you visited a, you know, went to a vineyard church I did for a go while. To a vineyard church for a while. I, and surely, like you had some moment that you're going to tell me about now, where one of these songs actually meant a lot to you me. and actually led to your conversion or, or and the conversions of many of your. No, friends. although actually, the songs that were really important to me was um, Rufus Wainwright's cover of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And like a bunch of other Leonard Cohen, like Leonard Cohen was very influential in my conversion. Um, I don't think that you can really I remember listening to a bunch of Christian phase Bob Dylan mm -hmm. at a certain point time mm -hmm. of life a lot, you know, mm -hmm. ring them bells and stuff Imagine. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Here, this is from a uh, longtime friend of the magazine, occasional foe of the magazine. Dear friend, John Wilson, um, okay, here's one. We happen to be living in a time when on every hand from quite various angles, books centrally concerned with sound and the quote soundscape are appearing in abundance, ranging from scholarly studies across disciplines to memoirs. How does or how should this many-sided conversation connect with thinking and talking about music? Well, I think this is a, I really love this question and this gets back to does music make you a good person or a bad person yeah. right we published a piece by friend of the pod dan and jay J jaganathan on um music and morals and one of his conclusions was basically that the the background quality to a lot of the music that we experience now is um something that's deeply corrupting like the the fact that we don't attend to it that we don't actually encounter it um that we just encounter it as this very cheap like entirely cheap um, drone that's the the soundtrack of our lives is itself a problem. It develops a habit of inattention. Mm -hmm. And one of our, you know, little favorite things on this pod, right, and I guess part of the sort of Luddite aspects of what we try to get at is, you know, so much of the technological world that we've constructed for human beings just in the last few decades is designed 
to lead us from distraction to distraction, mm-hmm. right? Um, and music is one of the big culprits mm-hmm. here. And music that is designed to be in the background, to just be running in your, you know, AirPods, um, earbuds, excuse me, um, is an invitation to this kind of spiritual habit of mm-hmm. just not ever really focusing on something. To me, I, I, I think that is one of the big things we have to relearn, yeah. right? is how to listen to music properly. And how not to listen to music. So this is, I mean, I was trying to think about, like, what is the vice, like, that we're discussing here? And I think it's acedia. Um, so, like, this this vice that's sort of, like, something like, uh, there are kind of a lot of words that cluster around it. It's a little bit like depression. It's a little bit like not responding to reality as it calls you to respond to it. It's a little bit like boredom. It's it's basically being bored with an interesting world, I think is kind of the way that I would describe a CDM most. And it seems to me that both listening to music inattentively, um, so like having music on and then like not listening to music, basically not, not giving music the attention that it's due um, is something that's going to like do something bad to you. On the Plow site, there's a beautiful essay on uh, the virtue of studiousness or studiosity by Sister uh, Mary Dominic Heath. And uh, she talks about the opposite of what we're just talking. And, and uh, Aquinas and Aristotle, apparently, and this was all news to me, but I th- found it very, very helpful mm-hmm. in thinking about these things, uh, talk about what it means to give something attention, mm-hmm. and they call that studiosity. But backing away from just the subject of music, because John asked about uh, soundscape more generally. Mm-hmm. So as I understand it, and I'm definitely not an expert here, mm-hmm. uh, soundscape is the term used to kind of talk about the acoustic environment as human beings perceive it. Mm-hmm. So here in the country, in upstate New York, where I love the soundscape right now is spring peepers, blackbirds, you know, some distant cars, mm-hmm. uh, possibly a dog, dog barking somewhere, maybe a tractor, you know. Uh, and Kids shrieking. Kids shrieking. And that is the sounds mm-hmm. that are here. Obviously, in the city, there's a different set of sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, in the types of environments that we've constructed for ourselves, those soundscapes have a pretty big effect on our our lives, I would mm-hmm. say on our spiritual lives. Mm-hmm. What are those things that yeah. we just, that are, you know, if it's true, as Plato says, and, and it's sort of been an argument that we just sort of have adopted here, mm-hmm. um, that, that music and sound kind of go directly to the soul, right? Mm-hmm. Have a direct access to our emotions. Then there's got to be a sense in which the soundscapes yeah. that we live in uh, affect us as well. Yeah. I do think that, like, the lack of quiet, the lack of silence in our lives, um, especially in our urban lives, is something that I, I'm not even sure we know we're missing. So noise pollution, right? And I think the New Yorker had an article a few years ago about how the lack of noise is increasingly becoming a luxury good that only extremely wealthy people who can buy, you know, huge ranches in Wyoming are able to Mm -hmm. ever experience Mm -hmm. a world that is quiet. And in that way, it's a bit similar to, you know, the studies um, that show that the majority of people, I believe, in the United States cannot see the Milky Way at night and there's these very basic human goods silence darkness darkness stars that are bit by bit just sort of being taken out of people's lives and out of kids lives i mean you think of how many people had their first kind of religious experience just on a dark quiet night looking up at the stars Mm -hmm. and very few people can do that now yeah of course you go to scripture and and the importance of silence right uh-huh. be still and know that i am god you know the idea that you can't that god's voice god's is the still small voice that you have to sort of be quiet in order to hear to the desert fathers and desert mothers who uh-huh. went to the desert in uh-huh. part for that quiet and so that then the song you know and the 
the chanted psalms in their case, mm-hmm. you know, emerged from a silence mm-hmm. that gave them meaning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think this question of silence is absolutely tied up to, you know, the good uses and, and bad uses of music. I think there's a kind of like aspect to what people call dopamine fasting to this. I hate that phrase because it it seems to me to reduce a very complicated um, and fundamental human experience to something that has to do with your neurotransmitters, which I think is reductive and not accurate in terms of the totality of what's going on. But basically like you need to allow yourself to just be still, to not have input, to let your attention not be grabbed by something where it's not, you know, where it's only partly engaged. You need to be be able to be fully engaged when you're fully engaged and to be able to be still when you're not. Um, and I think that that's something that, like, you know, we can do as kind of an exercise. I think we can do this. There's There's ways that we can approach this and and get to this, especially maybe during this, or I guess it'll be Easter season by the time that we're, um, this is released. So happy Easter, everyone. Um, but during a kind of like fasting season, especially, it seems to be appropriate to have some times of silence so that you can then listen to the music and really be there for it. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So in our community, in the Bruderhof community, it's traditional on Good Friday, among other days, for it to be a silent day. Mm-hmm. And you just don't run machinery. You don't have loud games. You don't do loud music. There's the the day is quiet. Now, weirdly enough, in parts of Europe, I know where I still live in Germany, that's the case by law. That on Good Friday uh, and on Armistice Day, uh, by law, uh, you cannot run your lawnmower. And um, then when you go to church and you sing the songs of the passion Mm -hmm. they're coming out of this quiet and it has this absolutely has a special power yeah so any more questions Susanna I think that that kind of wraps it up and that seems to me to be a good place to stop that's it for this music oriented season of the plowcast thanks for listening be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this and check out plow.com for the digital magazine you can also subscribe For $32 a year, you get the print magazine. For $99 a year, you can become a member of Plow. That membership carries a whole range of benefits, from free books to regular calls with the editors to invitations to special events and the occasional gift. Go to plow.com slash membership to learn more. For the next six weeks, you'll be able to listen each week to a new audio article from the current issue of the quarterly. And we'll be back with you in six weeks for more conversation on our new summer issue, Hope in an age of apocalypse. See you then. Ooh.